Hey everyone and welcome to another week of IB Biology. My name is Marcus and today we are going to look at more of the cell. So last week we covered the organelles and we looked at the cell in detail and today we're going to continue that and we're going to look at something very important which is transport across the cell membrane. Because obviously what goes on in an organism that is made up of lots of cells is not limited to just one cell but they need to communicate and we need to be able to get substances out of the cell into another cell etc so that'll be the focus of today and we're going to use a lot of stuff that we learned in the first two videos so be sure to watch those before if you're just joining us now and otherwise i'm looking forward to getting that done today so let's talk about the cell membrane again last week we already said it is a phospholipid bilayer that's a really bulky term for something that's pretty easy to understand. The thing is, bilayer means it's not just membrane that is sort of one layer, but it is bi, so a double layer. Bi means two. And so in that sense, we have on both sides the same structure. And that structure is we have a head, and that is made up of a glycerol and a phosphate. So the most important thing about this is they are hydrophilic compounds. Hydro means water and philic means love. And so they love water, they're attracted to it kind of. And so that means they don't repel water, so they are oriented towards water. And of course the cytoplasm, so the fluid inside of the cell, is also largely made up of water. And so we have these heads on the outsides. And then on the inside, we have the hydrophobic tails. They are fatty acids. And so that's sort of like a lipid structure, lipids being sort of oils, fats, etc. And as you probably know, fats and oils are hydrophobic. So they repel water. They are afraid of water, hydro water, phobic, afraid. And so now if we just put a bunch of these phospholipids together, they will actually arrange in that pattern because the hydrophobic tails are going to be repelled by the water so they swivel towards each other and the hydrophilic heads will go towards either the outside or the inside uh, of the cell which is the cytosol or cytoplasm made up largely of water and those were already a lot of very fancy words but there are some more so hydrophilic water loving so those are compounds that are not repelled by water they are mostly polar so they have a charge because water is also polar water molecules have a charge then we have hydrophobic and there are also the opposites so there can be lipophilic which means attracted to lipids and then on the other end of course also lipophobic and then if we have a compound such as these phospholipids with the phosphate hat and two fatty acid tails, they are called amphipathic because like amphibians, the animals that can live in, on land and in water, um, there are sort of two elements here that are combined. So they are amphipathic. And all of that makes the membrane really cool and useful because it is very fluid. It can sort of rearrange itself and it's not this set sort of it's not like a wall right stuff can get through and it does so all the time and for those substances that cannot just get through the membrane we have proteins that are channel proteins or carrier proteins that can get even those substances that are either too large or that are charged through our membrane so now let's try to get to the bottom of what kind of transport can we have across that membrane and with potentially these proteins that we have that can act as a channel or a carrier. The first and most important differentiation here is there is active transport and there is passive transport. Of course, as the name sort of already implies, active means we have to do something about it, right? And what we're doing is we need energy for it. And as you hopefully remember from uh, last week, Energy in the cell is in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. That's sort of our energy currency, if you will. And so we need to expend ATP if we have active transport. 
On the other hand, for passive transport, that sort of just happens, right? We don't need to expend any energy because those substances just move. And so now the differentiation is, and bear with me here, because that's going to be very, very important to get right. So for active transport, we are going against what is called the concentration gradient. So what is a concentration gradient? Let me try to explain that with pens. Might seem a bit stupid, but I think it's good visualization and it'll help you to get that right. So the concentration gradient just means you have two environments. And so the two environments here are just going to be my hands. And here I have four pens. So that will be what uh, we're going to transport. That's our substance. And here it's just two. And so concentration gradient means that here we have a higher concentration of pens in this case, and that could be any molecule, any substance, than here, right? And so in nature, usually, the state of equilibrium is reached. And what that means is that from here, we're going to have two pens, sorry, just one pen transferred over here, so that we have three on each side, right? Now we're at equilibrium because the concentration on both sides is the same. But again, in our original situation, four, two, so this is the area of high concentration and this is the area of low concentration. And it is passive transport if we go with the concentration gradient. So this one pen from over here going here, that is passive transport. It goes with the concentration gradient or down the concentration gradient. If on the other hand, let's go back to our initial situation, if I want to send a pen from over here, over here, that is against the concentration gradient. Against means from low to high concentration. If I want to do that, it must be active transport. So to get this one of those pens over here, I need active transport. I need to expend energy because I need to actively put them there. Whereas if one of them wants to go over here, that just sort of happens. If we have a membrane in the middle that is permeable to that substance. If that's not the case, we'll learn about that in a second. So let's talk about the specific kinds of transport here. Let's start with the kinds of passive transport that we have. So no energy is used and we're going down the concentration gradient. So first of all, we have simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is when we have small molecules and usually lipophilic molecules, um, and they can just go essentially through the plasma membrane. So that would include things like oxygen, atmospheric oxygen, so that's O2, that is CO2, all of those gases that can just diffuse across the membrane. Then we have osmosis, and osmosis is a bit tricky because essentially it is just diffusion, but here of water. So that's a bit counterintuitive. But for osmosis, we're going to look at solutes that are in water. And we're going to look at how um, that changes the amount of water somewhere. Because, and that's already maybe good to mention now, if I have four pens over here and two over here, and uh, let's say this is sort of two closed environments, obviously, whatever else is in there, if it's the same size, the container they're in, there will be less of whatever is around them. And so for osmosis, we would look at how that would equalize between the two if we have a membrane in the middle between them. And just to clarify here for you, before I said that the plasma membrane is semi-permeable, so only permeable to some things, and those are technically all small and lipophilic. So that means they're hydrophobic. So how can in osmosis, how can the water diffuse? How does that work? Well, it's a bit more complicated as always and the membrane has little aquaporins, so little holes, essentially, the water can get through. So I hope that makes more sense. And now finally, for the last kind of passive transport, facilitated diffusion. So again, it's diffusion, so that means passive transport down the concentration gradient, but facilitated. So that goes for those molecules that are either very large, like a sugar, which is a pretty big molecule, sucrose or glucose, but that also goes for charged molecules. 
And all of those we need uh, to facilitate. So facilitating means making something easier. And so we are using some of those protein channels to get this stuff through because it cannot get through the membrane by itself. Now, when it comes to active transport, we just have to distinguish between two different kinds. There's primary active transport where, as mentioned before, we just use ATP to use a protein pump. So now we don't call it protein channel because it works differently and we're moving stuff against the gradient from an area of low to an area of high concentration. And then there is secondary active transport where we couple molecules together as they move. And for that, we'll have examples later during the course. And in general, for all of this, there will be many, many examples in the in your brain the neurons work a lot with that kind of you know different forms of transport across membranes and we will see that time and again and again so this is really essential to get right now uh, which is why i spend so much time on it and now we just have two more things left one is vesicular transport so vesicles are essentially just little containers for substances and they are enclosed by a membrane as well so they're essentially just tiny little sacs of, of membrane um, that we can use and how that works is we are synthesizing some sort of compound so as you can remember from last week for instance in the endoplasmic reticulum if we take the example of the rough endoplasmic reticulum there are ribosomes on that endoplasmic reticulum, right? That's why it's called rough. We have the ribosomes on it. And so that's where we synthesize proteins destined for extracellular use. So for getting them extracellular outside of the cell. And as we learned, the endoplasmic reticulum as an organelle is membrane bound, right? That is only true in eukaryotes, but that is the case here. And so there, the membrane sort of buds off and creates a vesicle. So a vesicle is essentially just a phospholipid bilayer, a membrane, which again is super flexible, sort of bulging off, and then you have a little vesicle, right? That vesicle is then transferred to the Golgi apparatus, which is another organelle, and there it may be modified, and then it is fused with the plasma membrane of the cell, because again, it's made up of the same material. It's made up of a phospholipid bilayer as well. So we can just fuse it and expel whatever was in it to the outside. And that process is called exocytosis. Exo, out, off, and cytosis, if you have something along the lines of cytosis or cyto, it's always relating to the cell. And of course, we also have the opposite, which is endocytosis, where we take stuff into the cell in bulk. And so there, it's super interesting, we have the plasma membrane and it sort of engulfs, so it sort of shapes itself around whatever it wants to take in and at some point just closes and has created a vesicle to be transferred into the cell. 